Shana Tova. Kine Matov Umanaim Shevet Achim Gam Yachad. How good and beautiful is it for all of us to be here together for our annual family reunion. No matter how far we may have strayed, somehow on Rosh Hashanah, we find our way back home. Gathering together face to face feels precious and rare. These days, so much of our lives are conducted through technology and more and more we operate in silos with greater distance from our community. And as we get further and further from community, we increase more and more focus onto ourselves. You know, even the way we navigate from place to place has evolved to be more me-centric. Long ago, as many of you remember, in our pre-GPS world, we would unfold a big map, like the kind you used to get at AAA or at the rental car agency, remember? And you'd see the world laid out in front of you. And we actually had to figure out where we were on the map and how we fit in to the big picture. Now, when I plug in my location and destination into Google Maps, it places me at the center of the screen. And remarkably, wherever I go, I remain at the center. No longer do I see myself in the context of the greater world, but rather I am the perpetual focal point, the center of the universe. This is, after all, the culture of the big me, as the writer David Brooks put it. We live in an era of selfies, a time of incessant self-glorification and self-promotion. Here I am in Hawaii, on the beach, drinking coffee, cooking dinner, watch me with my friends, with my family, by myself, me, me, me. You know, it's so easy to get caught up in this trend. But all of this Instagram and Twitter and Facebook may be creating an illusion of connection when, in fact, we may be more disconnected than ever. We spend more and more time in front of these glowing screens and less and less time in face-to-face -face encounters. Studies show that we belong to fewer organizations and are less engaged in communal activities. On the Jewish front, the fastest growing segment of United States Jewry is the unaffiliated. So with all this focus on ourselves, there is less room, less time, less motivation to be part of a community. But you know, people are meant to be in relationships, real relationships, not virtual connections. Judaism provides a counterbalance to the culture of the big me, an antidote to the thrum of individualism. Yes, our sage Hillel famously said, Im ainani li mili, if I am not for myself, then who will be for me? But then immediately followed it with, Ukshaani la'atzmi ma'ani, but if I am only for myself, what am I? In the creation story, which we read here tomorrow at Temple, God create, we read about God creating the heaven, the earth, the trees, the sun, the moon, the sky. And after each act of creation, God says, Tov, it is good. And after God creates the first human, the Torah says that God says, Tov me'od, very good. But the first thing that God finds lotov, or not good, is this. Lotov heyot adam levado. It is not good for a person to be alone. So God, the ultimate and first yenta, 
starts matchmaking right away. <clears throat> but the purpose of that first companion isn't necessarily romantic. We're told that God created Eve to be an ezer kenegdo, a partner to face Adam. All of us need a person or people to face us, to validate us, to celebrate our joy, and to help ease our suffering. This summer, I did some reading about the phenomenon of unique locations with a preponderance of people who live to the age of 100. These places are now known as blue zones. And as you can imagine, there's much research that's being done about places like Sardinia, Italy, and the island of Icaria off of Greece to figure out why there are so many centenarians living there. <coughs> Rabbi Davis, you'll be happy to know that a low-fat, mostly vegan diet is one explanation. Another is the amount of walking and physical activity that their lifestyles require. But the explanation that I find most compelling is the social routine of daily life. As reported in the Wall Street Journal, people meet on the street daily and savor each other's company. They count on one another. If a neighbor gets sick, another one is right there to help him or her. If a shepherd loses his flock, the other shepherds rally round with donated sheep. We're told that friends meet every morning for coffee, they play dominoes in the afternoon, and they drink homemade wine at night. None of them went on a longevity diet or bought a treadmill or joined a gym. Instead, they sustain each other in the way they live their lives. They face each other. Judaism teaches us to do the very same thing. Today we come to synagogue for this annual reunion, and we stand together before God and say, Avinu Malkenu, our loving parent, our sovereign ruler, Hatanu Lefanecha, we have sinned before you. And these prayers are always spoken in the first person plural. They remind us that we are not alone. And next week, when we come together on Yom Kippur, we will say, Al Chet Shechatanu Lefanecha, for the sin that we have committed against you. And then we recite this litany of sins that no one of us alone could possibly, please God, have committed. But we say it together for the sin of gluttony, for the sin of disrespecting our parents, of profaning God's name. So why does our tradition teach us to confess to these things that we haven't done? Isn't it hard enough to fess up to our own shortcomings? Our tradition is teaching us that in the end, we are all responsible for each other. I prop you up as you speak your words of truth, and you support me as I speak mine. And together, we hold each other up. We face each other. A story from our Mishnah illustrates this with great poignancy. It teaches that in ancient times, when people would make their pilgrimage to the ancient temple in Jerusalem, they would file into the courtyard one by one, circling to the right. But not everyone circled to the right. For some, Misha e Ro Davar, Someone to whom something terrible has happened. That person circles to the left. Why is this person in an hour of need singled out from the community in such a visible way? Shouldn't they be allowed to blend in at such a difficult time? 
but I'll tell you there's a reason why they move in the opposite direction. Because the text teaches us that every person who passes him is obligated to stop and ask, Malach, what happened to you? And each time, the one who is suffering is instructed to face his neighbor and answer with his or her own reality. My father has Alzheimer's, and he doesn't recognize me anymore. And then another person follows, walking against the grain. I feel like I don't know my daughter anymore. She's hurting herself, and I don't know how to stop her. And then someone else. My wife wants a divorce. My life is unraveling. And then another. I just found out I have breast cancer, and I don't know how to tell my children. Every person who's in that temple courtyard walking to the right must stop to face the brokenhearted. And each time when they encounter the other, they whisper, may God bring you comfort and know that you are not alone. The rabbis understood that it is precisely when we are struggling, exactly when we are brokenhearted, that we most need to face each other. Just when we feel like the world is moving without us, that we are utterly alone in our suffering, we want to just go home, crawl into bed, and put the blanket over our heads. That's when we're called upon to show up. And we have to reveal our aching hearts to one another. And with each step we take, with every gaze of understanding or nod of comfort or word of blessing, our burden is lightened just a little bit. Being part of a community is recognizing that we are all in this life together. Today, you are walking from left to right. Tomorrow, it may be me. Today, your flock has disappeared. Tomorrow, it may be mine. So my friends, how does this translate from the ancient times to the present? from that temple in Jerusalem to Temple Beth Shalom. A few stories from our congregation illustrate just how we create holy community here. You know, this year we lost one of our great mitzvah heroes with the sudden and untimely death of Zev Beichman. For at least as, I've been, as long as I've been at Temple Beth Shalom, Zev has been a conscience of our synagogue, collecting and bringing medical supplies to Haiti, art supplies to children in Israel, supporting the homeless at Camilla's house. And when he died suddenly this spring, leaving behind his three daughters and his wife, his family was reeling with shock. Zev left instructions that he wanted to be buried within 24 hours, as is Orthodox Jewish tradition. And so everyone from his family to Rabbi Glickstein to the cemetery and the funeral home, everyone raced to honor Zev's wishes. He died at Mount Sinai Hospital in the evening, and he was buried the very next afternoon. And there was no time to make preparations or get the word out. So at approximately 4.45 p.m. on the day of Zev's burial, Temple Beth Shalom sent out a notification of his death. And they announced a shiva minion at 6 o'clock p.m. <clears throat> I arrived at the home at about 5.20, and it was completely quiet. The family had just returned from the cemetery, stunned and grief-stricken. And as I sat there with Zev's wife, Teresita, it occurred to me that maybe the family would be the only people at the Minion. 
After all, we had just sent out notification of the minion minutes before. But at 5.40 p.m., to my surprise, a member of our temple showed up, and then another member, and then someone who had been to Israel with Zev, and then someone else. One by one, they filed in. Each had read the notice of Zev's death, dropped what they were doing, and showed up for the minion. Well, of course it was inconvenient, and it meant leaving work early or skipping the gym or getting a babysitter. But they came. They showed up. And then someone noticed that there wasn't any food there. So after the minion, she went out and got platters for the family and brought them back. As anyone who has ever sat Shiva knows, people showing up to say Kaddish with us has infinite meaning. I remember it well when my father died. And then there's the story of Louise Dogen, who moved here from New York, pregnant with her first child, and she signed up for our Shalom Baby class. But even before the classes started, we got a message from Lou that there were complications with her pregnancy, and she was confined to bed rest. She was scared and alone. She was new in town, and her partner traveled for work. She needed help, and she didn't know where to turn, and so she called us. It was as simple as sending an email to several other moms who would understand her situation. And you know what? They called her, they visited her, they connected her to a high-risk doctor, they brought her food, and some of them even attended the bris of her very healthy and beautiful son, who now attends our foundation school. And you know, it's not just in times of heartbreak or need that we show up for each other. Over the past year or so, our Saturday morning minion has become a family of sorts. As new member Michael Berman wrote in an article in Hakol, after a few Shabbat mornings at the minion, it felt like a group hug. This past year, a young member of the temple named Kevin Jackson and his grandfather started coming to Minyan regularly. Kevin was preparing for his bar mitzvah, but because of severe learning and developmental challenges, it was unclear exactly what the bar mitzvah would look like. And compounding that hardship was the fact that his father had recently died leaving his mom to uphold the family alone. Week after week, Kevin and his grandfather showed up at our minion, joyfully learning the melodies and the rhythms of the service. And toward the end, I remember Kevin was coming up every week for an aliyah, beaming with pride and anticipation at his upcoming bar mitzvah. And when the day finally arrived, not only were Kevin's family and friends and teachers at the service, but the entire minion who had embraced him showed up, shepping Nachis along with his family. Because being part of a community means that we not only share each other's burdens, we thrill at each other's joys. While our big me culture might seduce us into thinking that we'll find happiness as atomized individuals, untethered from community institutions and obligations. Judaism and Temple Beth Shalom remind us that we need each other. No matter how much whiz-bang technology we may have, it cannot offer the intimacy of a safe space to share our vulnerabilities and discover our gifts. You know, we create meaning in our lives by showing up for each other, by facing each other. And every time we do, 
whether it's showing up to a service project or a justice jam or a shiva minion or a Friday night service, we knit together our separate and fragmented lives into something greater, something transcendent. We create a holy community because when we face each other, we face God. So Judaism brings us together for this annual reunion to remind us that we belong together. We may be at the center of our Google Maps, but community reminds us that we are part of something much larger than ourselves. We need an Ezer Kinegdo, a partner or people to face us when we dance and when we grieve. We need to extend a hand in friendship to give our lives meaning. And you know what? Sometimes we need a hand to hold on to for dear life. When we conclude a section of Torah, it's our custom to recite together, Chazak, Chazak, Benit Chazak. Be strong, be strong, and let us strengthen one another. As we conclude the year of 5775 and commence the new year of 5776, this moment beckons us to uncover the wisdom of these profound words. Kazak, Kazak. Alone, each of us has individual strengths. Benit Kazek, but together, we fortify and strengthen each other. How good and beautiful it is for us to gather here together. Amen.